There's all kinds of stuff at the nurseries and at the garden centers to put into your garden. Great time uh, to be considering doing some container gardening. Container gardening for beginners is a really simple thing to do. And we're gonna go over some of the main points that you need to think about when you're choosing how to get started, including how to choose pots and soil and which plants do best in containers. Uh, it's not gonna be an exhaustive list of things because there's so many things that can work, but I'm, I picked out the things that are easiest to do, so would be really easy for people that are just getting started. So first of all, I just wanted to talk about reasons why people grow in containers. There's a lot of folks that live in multifamily housing. Uh, you may be in a condo or an apartment. You might be limited to a balcony or have a little patio space. And you don't have a big yard. And you don't have a patch of earth that you can actually cultivate. So containers come in super handy then. And there's lots of variety of things that you can do in those settings. <clears throat> Some people are limited by sun or with sun in their garden. Um, perhaps you have a house where you do have a garden, but somebody built a taller house next door. And this happens in urban areas all the time. Uh, people start with a garden that gets shaded out and then they have to figure out different methods. So one of the benefits of containers is you can move them around. And because the sun moves around during different seasons as well and hits the yard in a different way, depending on what season it is, <clears throat> you can take advantage of that. And even with evergreen plants that you can move from spot to spot. You might have an area that's very public. Um, maybe it's near a sidewalk and you, um, you know, don't want dogs uh, taking advantage of those spaces uh, to use um, as they walk by. So you could put things in pots that will raise them up above the, the dog level, um, keep them safer uh, and protect them a little bit. What I really like about containers, and I do have a yard, but I still grow a lot of things in containers, is that you have full control of the soil and how water, how you can water them and the weeds that come into the pots because they're, they're microcosms of what a big garden would be. So way easier to manage. Um, you can choose the soil that you put into them instead of just having to deal with the soil that's already in your yard, uh, which is fine to do, of course. Uh, but you can purchase exactly what you want, purchase a container that you like, something that looks good to you, and then um, get the plants in there that you like. And then aesthetics. I have some little small pots. It's, it's a little bit time intensive because they're small and I have to water them a lot, but they're very cute. Shade of green uh, that looks nice and kind of a bright green that looks nice against the dark green of my house. So I put those on the porch railing and I change out the flowers that are in them. So right now they have pansies in them. And then in the summertime, they have other things like marigolds or nasturtiums. So I'm getting ready to switch those out soon. And then this is a great investment where you don't have to spend a lot of time, money and energy to find out how you feel about gardening. So you can get practice, um, without having to really invest or go to too much trouble or you know too much work too much back work to get a container set up and just grow something in it and see how how it does and how you feel so the first thing always with any gardening adventure that we always tell people is to work with the soil healthy soil is a key to healthy plants when you're choosing soil for containers, you want to look for something that's labeled potting soil or potting mix, like you see in these two examples, because they are formulated in a special way to be able to drain well. So they are lightweight <clears throat> mixes. Uh, they vary depending on who the manufacturer is. Uh, they have different kinds of materials in them, uh, sometimes soil less completely. So there's no soil at all. It's just a combination of organic matter and mineral product that combines to make enough nutrient for your plants to be able to use. You can source certified organic brown brands and both of these are, you'll notice this Omri um, logo here. You can see this on the label as well. This is the Cedar Grove uh, potting soil mix. It's made from yard waste and food waste that's collected in the Northwest and uh, composted for us. 
And then Black Gold is a great product, uh, very easy to find at many stores around the area. It also has this symbol on it. So this is the Organic Materials Review Institute. They are a nonprofit that certifies products that can be used in organic agriculture. And um, fortunately for us, they're certifying things that are used at home, homeowner level as well, um, not just for people who are growing um, agriculturally. So you can look for this label on any product that you want to use in the garden, and you can look at their site to see what they have to say about it. That's uh, very um, easy to do. So they are, these are both locally available. I was at Fred Meyer the other day. I saw both of these um, side by side. And there are different versions of black gold. There's some that are, are just the regular soil. The natural one is this orange, uh, an organic certified one is this orange label with the lily on it. And then um, the Cedar Grove potting soils are all certified organic. But you can also make your own. So if you wanna be adventurous, you can purchase different things and mix them together and create your own blend. And, and the fun thing about this is you can experiment with what works really well for the types of things you're growing. You can expand on this, these two basic recipes to add things that might benefit a certain type of plant that you like to grow. But these are the basics here. And in the first one, using a five gallon bu bucket for measure, you're gonna use one part of coconut core and one part of perlite to two parts of compost. So whatever proportions you're using in that five gallon bucket, you can make it half full for the one parts and full for the two parts. You mix that all together, or you can take something else and, and mix it in parts into that five gallon bucket as a storage container. Um, this is a great combination um, to create a soilless mix that looks similar to this that your roots are going to grow in very well from your plants. Coconut core is a substitute for peat moss, which is not a sustainable harvest product. And so we, we recommend that people use coconut core instead. Uh, it has a little more nutrient in it, actually, and it's a little more neutral in uh, acidity and rather than being um, more acidic like uh, peat moss is. So perlite is a, a rock product that are these little white rocks that are porous and they let water through them and air through them. It keeps the mix lighter, it lets the roots breathe, it, it enables the water to drain better. And then the compost adds that organic matter that's very important for um, nutrition and for uh, microorganisms to feed off of so that they can help to feed your plant. Recipe number two uses soil. Uh, and then compost and perlite. But what I want to point out is that you need to look for purchased soil that is sterilized and is not just coming out of your garden. You can use soil out of your garden, but you could have contamination from uh, some fungal issues and especially with weed seeds. So you want to be careful about that. If you're willing to, you know, experiment a little, <clears throat> it's worth a try. If you have some soil, you can dig up and use these other products to make a really cheap um, recipe. You can do that, just test it out. Don't go ahead and start using it until you've tested it to make sure <clears throat> that it's not gonna sprout with a ton of weed seeds and, and um, be a problem for you. Especially if you're using it to seed things into and then you have to figure out which seeds you put in there and which are the weed seeds. So you can add other nutrients and all of these things that are listed below here are things that will add other kinds of nutrients to the mix. <clears throat> worm castings are great if you're doing a worm <clears throat> bin heart, um, food, food waste system. Uh, kelp meal can help to add nitrogen. The worm castings add a lot of micronutrients as well as help condition the soil and make it um, drain well. Um, the green sand can help with potassium and the mineralized rock dust with phosphate, so phos phosphorus. So these are things you can add to add, sort of like adding fertilizer to the mix. Then you have to choose your containers. And we're going to start with the bigger, more luxurious looking containers and move into all kinds of choices that you can think about uh, that might be more affordable. Um, or <clears throat> could be using reusing products that you already have at home. Um, but these are the ones that you see in this slide. 
that are the most decorative uh, would be the most formal if you wanted to make a statement, if you wanted to have a nice pot in an entry to the house. Uh, these are the types of pots and, and um, containers that you're looking for. And what we're seeing here is terracotta, which is just a clay product. And what you really want to find is things that are sourced from really good clay because you can get very cheap terracotta products that won't last very many years. They'll start to chip away if they're left out all season long. The, the rain, the thaw and the freeze will affect them. Um, there's fiber resin, which are these pots. These are nice because they're really lightweight. So they look like big heavy pots and they are heavier of course when you fill them full of soil, but to move them around isn't as hard as moving something like a clay pot. Um, it doesn't have as much weight. One thing you want to know um, between these two that's different is that the terracotta pots dry out more. They're very porous, so they will dry out faster. So plants that don't mind that or prefer drier soils are really good options for a terracotta pot. And when you start moving into some of these other ones that are more sealed, like fiber resin or this glazed clay, then you can put in plants that um, appreciate more moisture in the soil. <clears throat> the glazed clay, um, there's a lot of really beautiful choices out there and you can get all different colors, things that match your house, things that, um, you know, go well with your house uh, and different design elements on them, different shapes of pots from round to sort of more um, rectangular to um, tall and skinny, lots of different choices. And then wood is always a, um, an option and law, there's a lot of people who build these and locally I've seen even on next door a lot of people that are building planting boxes for people right now. Uh, cedar is a great choice, especially these beautiful um, clean cedar pieces. Uh, it's good looking. It lasts a long time. It has natural preservatives in the wood. They do dry out easily like a terracotta pot does. So you want to make sure that um, you have good um, soil in here that's going to hold water well. And then the zinc pots are very lightweight. They do retain a little bit more heat. Sometimes people use these more as a uh, sort of a decorative pot that's on the outside and they put a plastic pot inside that the plant is in. And that's a great way to manage these as well. Um, but either way, you can plant directly into these if you want to. And there's a lot of really beautiful designs and shapes of these as well. So then let's look at some more utilitarian types of pots, things that might get you through a few seasons or they, they look nice, some of them, but they, they aren't quite as fancy. Um, let's start over here with the rice hole and the bamboo fiber pots. These are made to be biodegradable uh, out of materials that are, you know, just part of um, the rice holes in particular, just part of sort of waste product from the industries, uh, rice industry. So that's a great option. Uh, because you're using something that's being reused rather than thrown away. Uh, this will break down over time. It takes a really long time. It's not going to break down while you're growing your plant in it very easily. Uh, same with the bamboo fiber pot. But one thing I will caution you with is they're very dense. They don't breathe as well. And so the soil stays very wet in there. So you don't need to water as often, which is a benefit. You just need to make sure that you're checking them and putting your fingers into the soil to make sure uh, so that you do not overwater things. They come in a lot of different colors too. Some of them, bamboo fiber in particular, there's some fun colors. And then the pulp pots. These are very temporary, but they're great for growing vegetables in um, because they're lightweight, they're easy to source, they're not expensive. They come in really good sizes, lots of big sizes. You, great for tomatoes, um, great for doing potatoes in, something um, that you want to move around anyway. Uh, for crop rotation reasons. And so these will break down after a while. There are different grades of pulp pots. Some of them are sturdier and thicker than others. Uh, but I use a lot of these in my yard to grow things like peppers and um, some tomatoes. Um, I have, sometimes I have herbs in them or flowers and herbs together and just sort of intersperse those amongst other things. And then of course, there's always lots of plastics. So there are so many plastic pots in the world, tons and tons and tons of them. Sometimes you can find them recycled and you know reuse them and that's great uh, instead of buying new. But there's 
utilitarian ones like these black plastic growers pots. These you can find at places like Home Depot and Lowe's, um, some of the garden stores and nurseries. These are really great utilitarian um, pots that you can get in very large sizes to grow things like a tomato in. The black pot heats up well, it holds water well, it stands up to the winter weather. Um, these are all food grade plastics, so they're safe for you to use. Um, then there's some really pretty decorative ones that you can use that look more like <clears throat> a clay pot or a glazed clay pot. And um, those can be more attractive and they have the same qualities as some of these um, black pots do. They just look, look different. There are the stacking pots. And actually I just got some for free. I was just about to buy some and somebody wanted to donate them to Tilt Alliance and we had enough in our garden, but they wanted to give them to us. So we said, yes, we'll take them. And um, I was able to bring them home to put my strawberries in. So I will be this weekend happily planting strawberries into these. They alternate as they stack so that you have all these multiple little planting spaces. And then the idea is they have holes in them that you water the top and it drips down, but it's always a good idea to water each segment to make sure that it gets enough water. There's a lot of these colorful pots out there. So if you're a fan of really bright colors, there's some really fun ones in different sizes. And this is some of what I have like on my porch with the pansies in them right now. And then there's these bowl shaped planters <clears throat> that are great for things like lettuce bowls or radishes and short, um, uh, short rooted plants. Uh, these look great, you know, in collections. Um, they can be very attractive. They also come in different colors. I've seen, <clears throat> excuse me, I've seen these colors and I've seen brown and green. And all of them um, are pretty easy to find. I've seen both of these types at places like Rite Aid um, in their gardening section. And Fred Meyer carries things like this as well. And then one of the newer things that we're seeing more of, and this sort of erupted from people making their own out of burlap sacks, like you see in this bottom picture, uh, making grow bags. Um, so people started manufacturing them. And some of them are fabrics and some of them are plastic materials. Uh, they vary. Uh, often um, you'll find ones like this that are intended to grow potatoes in that have this little Velcroed window. And um, the point of that is that you can harvest as the potatoes are developing in there. Um, to grow potatoes in something like this, you would put some soil in and your tubers that you're going to grow at the bottom and cover them and not fill the whole thing with soil. You're going to let the tops grow up a little bit and then you're going to cover them with soil again and let them grow up and cover them with soil. And you're going to do that until the top is full of soil and the uh, green tops are coming out of the um, pot. And the reason for that is you've developed a root stem that goes all the way to the bottom so that this whole thing will develop potatoes inside of it. They develop off the stem that's underground. And then the genius of this, of course, is that as they're developing, you don't have to disturb the whole plant. You can just open up and do a little harvesting to get some fresh potatoes. My, I just bought some this year. I'm going to try them out. My question is, will the dirt get stuck in this Velcro and make it harder to, for that to stay closed? And I'll find out. Many of them have handles on them, so it makes them easier to move even when they're full of soil. And they come in a variety of sizes, some pretty large sizes too. They're good enough for um, doing things like a tomato as well in them. Now they're going to dry out a little bit more easily, so you have to check for their water needs. And the nice thing about this one is you can actually look into the bag and see how much water is, is in there um, and how moist the soil is. But you can also just use simple coffee uh, roaster bags like this, uh, fold the tops down and you do the same process if you're gonna grow potatoes in them, you layer them um, as they grow. But you could put other things in here as well. They're temporary solutions. Burlap will break down over time, especially where it's hitting the soil. Um, but it takes a few years for that to happen. So it can be a very useful um, pot for you to have in your yard pretty quickly and easily. And then there's the wine and whiskey barrels. And then people have been planting these for a very long time. You can go out, you're, you used to be able to go out to St. Michelle and source these. I haven't tried that in a few years, but 
they're, they can be pretty large, which is nice. They can be large enough to put, you know, a tomato in plus some things around the edges, or you could put in um, ornamental things or a, a shorter blueberry. Actually, even some of the tall blueberries would work well on these. They're big enough. They're pretty nice because they last for a very long time. They're slats of wood that are reinforced with steel bands and um, they are food safe. Uh, they're used for uh, alcohol and lots of things like rosemary and tomatoes that need big spaces for the roots do really well in pots like this. They're rustic looking. So if you like that look, this is a good choice. And now also we see a lot of people growing in galvanized containers. I have two troughs in my backyard, um, water tanks. Um, you have to drill holes in the bottom and you have to drill big enough holes that it's, it actually does drain out well. And you need to have some sort of elevation underneath them in order to not plug the holes when it sits on the ground. So you need to lift them up a little with a brick or a paver. Uh, any kind of paving stone would work. You can find these in different sizes, like you see here in different shapes. Um, and again, they have more of a rustic look, kind of a farm-like farm look, uh, and can be pretty cute to put together. And then people have gotten very creative with things. Um, reuse of materials, um, a use of something that you wouldn't expect, so like these kiddie pools being used as planting spaces. These, This is... Um, uh, Trinity College up in uh, Everett had um, these on their roof. They had built a whole rooftop garden on top of the parking garage across the street from the college. And they put in these big planting boxes where they had trees actually growing. And they put in <clears throat> sod that was just um, bounded by bamboo barrier around the outside. So they sort of created little islands where they put soil directly on the pavement. <clears throat> to grow on and then they had these kinds of you know planter boxes sort of interspersed so they did a really creative um, job of interspersing different kinds of things but the use of the kiddie pools sort of fascinated me they had to put holes in the bottom um, and then they drained off a bit also you see that there's some tires here there's been a lot of um, discrepancy over the years about between people about whether these are safe or not most of the studies that I've seen in recent years say they're fine to grow things in, uh, that the, the chemicals that are in the tire don't leach out into the soil. Uh, where they would be dangerous is if you were to shred it or burn it, and then there's toxins there. But this is just an example of a completely containerized setting on top of a garage roof that's all a concrete. Um, down here, we're seeing somebody reusing cans that they just found ways to mount on their fence above their other boxed vegetable garden down below. Um, and this is great, they put herbs in these. So that's a great solution. Um, they don't need a ton of space. You would pick smaller varieties because these are smaller containers, but um, it's creative use of that. And again, the burlap sack in the same way, this is the same garden where the these guys are. And you could, you could put different things in here. You could have strawberries spilling out of here. Um, do a bunch of lettuce out of there. Uh, and it's a temporary measure as well. So you can move your garden around if you like to change things up a bit. Um, and then I've seen people using, you know, everybody has a million of these reusable bags. I know I do. And um, some of them sturdier um, plastic ones can withstand holding um, soil. And, you know, you can grow lettuce or greens straight out of that. Don't forget to use your vertical spaces wherever you are. So if you're on a balcony in particular, this becomes very important. You can capitalize on the walls if you have any, on the railing um, that's on the balcony. Uh, on a patio area, you could also create walls made out of pallets uh, that become could divide up space on a patio. So you can kind of create little rooms. Um, so a lot of ways to use vertical spaces in small spaces. You can reuse pots that maybe have chips in them and make sort of a little cascading um, planter. Um, and these are, are basically wired together and also sometimes you run rebar through there to hold them together. Uh, and you just stack them. So you're making your own stackable pot. This house has 
a, an amazing uh, pot collection going straight up the sides of their house here. To do something like this effectively, you would need to install drip irrigation unless you wanted to be on a very tall ladder watering this a lot, um, which I don't think anybody want, does want to do that. So drip irrigation would work. You just run it through the whole system and then it um, has some kind of connection at the bottom um, that goes out and is um, hooked up to the water system. You could put it on a timer. But I think this was just an amazing creative solution somebody came up with to have a place to grow things. So this is just a little slide with some examples of things in pots. Um, you see the, the wine barrel that somebody painted um, and they have a mix of vegetables. They, it looks like they have some kind of brassica in there with some lettuces and pansies. You can get columnar apples these days. They're sh uh, dwarf and short and stay in this um, columnar shape. They have little minor branches that come off of there that bear the fruit. They don't take a huge pot um, and they don't take up very much space. You could create, create a line of those to sort of define an area. Um, you have blueberries here and here, uh, different kinds. This is a very dwarf one. This is very decorative. Um, so it almost just has more of a uh, ornamental look to it, but it's actually gonna fruit and produce um, blueberries for you. Um, and the same with this one. Blueberries are beautiful and um, artistic looking plants. They get good fall color. They have different color to the leaves when they come out in the spring and the stems can vary in color from yellow to reds to greens. Um, so they can be really uh, ornamental. Strawberries can grow in all kinds of situations. I have an old barbecue stand that I put a bowl shaped planter into one of these kind of guys up here and I filled it with wild strawberries and they cascaded out of that and hit the ground and now they run, it's near sort of a little walkway area and they run along the edge of the walkway. Um, so they found their way through my garden um, where I would never have been able to plant anything because there's not enough earth there for me to dig up and actually plant. But they, um, because they run as a stolen, which is the above ground stem and then they put roots down where the little plant grows, they did it themselves. Strawberries are very gregarious and very um, versatile and can work in all kinds of potted settings. And then this ch these chives here, I want to point out, are in just one of those um, concrete blocks. Um, you know, they're drainage. They can be drainage tiles that you could turn up, up like this upside and then fill with soil um, and grow things out of. So lots of different solutions. So here's some basic principles for how to choose a plant. Um, you always wanna choose the right plant for the right place. Uh, as I said, you can move containers around. So that's helpful because you, you can move them to where the sun actually is if they need a lot of sun. If you have an evergreen plant um, and you want to grow it in the summer in a um, very sunny site, it could winter over in a different site in your yard that didn't get uh, the hot summer sun um, but still would be okay um, in the garden. You just move it to where uh, the sun is for the winter. So you have to know how the sun moves in your garden, what's blocking it at different times of year, how high is the sun, it's lower in the winter than it is in the summer, um, and it's up less time in the winter. And so there you're gonna have a lot more shady areas in your garden in the winter time, but you also might have a deciduous tree it drops its leaves and it's gonna let more light through in an area that in the, in the summertime it does not. So you need to take all those things into account and know how the sun moves in the sky in different seasons. Um, and then, you know, just in general, what's blocking the light around you is, you know, is it your house? Is it your neighbors? Um, is it a tall tree that's in somebody's yard? A tall tree two houses down sometimes can make a difference in your own garden. So here's an example of the, some of the vegetables. And the, uh, as I said, these are not exhaustive lists, but these are some of the more common things that people ask about or that we grow and that we recommend um, uh, situations for. So tomato, pepper, eggplant, rosemary, lavender, sunflower, squashes, and this includes any of them, pumpkins, winter squash, summer squash, cucumber, beans, marigolds, and corn. 
all prefer to have at least six hours of sun and more if you can get it. Six to eight hours is ideal and they will produce more for you. Um, you'll notice that most of these are things that are flowering and fruiting in some capacity. And so that's part of the um, issue here is that in order to get a good crop of flowers, you need to have a lot of sun. And the more sun you have and the more flowers you have, the more pollinators you have to be able to enable your tomatoes and other plants to produce well. So um, more sun is better for guys like this. But you can get away with less sun for these plants. And typically, again, these are plants that we're not looking in general for them to flower with maybe the exception of broccoli, which does like a lot of sun. Broccoli will always do better in full sun, but you could still get like sprouting broccoli um, in a shadier situation. Leafy greens, um, beets, potatoes, carrots, radishes, chives, parsley, and mint. And mint in the wild grows kind of in shady stream bank areas. It likes a lot of water, but also likes some partial shade. Um, none of these are things that we're trying to get big fruits out of. Um, we're trying to produce leaves, uh, mostly to grow, to eat, in some cases, roots underground. And again, the more sun they get, the bigger uh, um, a crop you're going to get and the bigger each, each uh, individual um, plant will get. But you can get away with it if you have a shadier spot. And you can see here, I'm going to go back to this other slide. You can see here there's a couple different kinds of plastic pots being used. This is about the smallest pot you'd want to use for a tomato. Um, they need a lot of root space um, in order to keep them happy and to keep the soil adequately watered. And then these marigolds are in one of those galvanized um, containers. And then the, whoops, all these broccoli plants are in um, wine barrels and older ones. You can see they're starting to come apart. That's what happens over time in the sun they start to sort of split but it takes many many years for that to happen. Um, so choosing the right pot for the plant you want to know what the mature size of the plant will be and that will help you determine the size of the pot you need. Something like a rosemary um, if you have a creeping rosemary or a trailing one they're not going to get quite as huge you can get away with smaller pots like maybe you know the the five gallon um, to ten gallon size if it's going to be um, one of the tall upright rosemaries that can get five feet tall or more, you need a really big pot or it um, prefers to be in the ground. Um, but you have to have a good enough container for it in order to keep it happy. Um, it's important to know if it's an annual plant. If, is it going to die in one growing season? Something like rosemary needs to, it's perennial. It's a woody shrub, really. So it's going to grow for a very long time. But an annual plant like a basil, you know, it'll only need as big a pot as it's going to get in that one year. And usually that's not like a five gallon pot. It's more in, in terms of a one to two gallon size pot. If it dry, dies after one growing season, typically it's going to be a smaller scale plant. Not always. Something like a, a sunflower can be quite tall, but its root system isn't going to be huge. So we're trying to cater to the roots. Um, if it's a woody plant like a rosemary or a lavender, you're going to need a bigger pot in general because it's more of a shrub. And then what kind of a root system does it have? You want to make sure you're not trying to do large tap-rooted plants in pots. They don't like pots very well um, and they will suffer after a period of time. I have a walnut tree in a pot I'm trying to give away to a friend who um, I live in West Seattle, so I'm a little landlocked right now, and she's up, way up in the northeast part of town, so we haven't been able to get together to get this plant to her, um, but it's starting to not like the pot it's in. It needs to get out of it because it's a taprooted plant. Then you can also choose smaller varieties, so you can cater to, you know, the size garden you have and just do small containers. Uh, the tomato that you see on the top left is called um, Tiny Tim. It's very little. It's, it doesn't grow much bigger than this. It produces a lot of fruit um, and you'll have a crop off of it, but you're not going to get as much fruit as you would off a big, tall, you know, indeterminate tomato. 
So we have tomatoes that we call determinate, that they grow to a predetermined size. They grow more shrub-like. They bear a crop usually in a shorter amount of time. So these are great for also if you're canning because you get your crop in a shorter period of time and you can can everything together. There are also um, indeterminate plants um, that grow more like a vine and many of our tomatoes are these. Um, determinate is always shorter, smaller um, than an indeterminate, not necessarily um, as not as wide, they can get wide, but they are smaller and they don't have as big a root system. Indeterminate tomatoes need pruning, they need caging, even more than just the tomato uh, cages that you buy at the store, but they need trellising, staking. Uh, there's all kinds of um, interesting ways that people uh, train up tomatoes to be able to um, keep the vines up. And then you can also use that if you have large pots and a series of them to create also a barrier that can create a, a room in your garden or on your patio uh, where you can wall off something by just creating a tomato wall. Um, small leaved things that are compact like Greek basil as opposed to the large leaf basil which gets taller and rangier, they do fine in pots, but these do better in small pots. So if you just have a small space and you do want some fresh basil, this is a great choice. This looks nice on something like your outdoor table that you sit around um, and it, it can be very handy for you to be able to pick from. Um, but there's a lot of varieties that are described as good for t containers, but you still want to make sure of what the mature size of that plant is to determine what size of pot you will need. And then is it a tomato versus, you know, um, something like a marigold plant, which really, you know, isn't going to be as big as a tomato. Even the big tall uh, marigolds won't need as much root space as a tomato plant would. You can choose plants that, you know, have shallow root systems. These are the ones that you could put in these bowl shaped containers. So this is one that's made of wood um, that's really pretty. So you can like, you know, go to the thrift stores and find old wood salad bowls and make uh, container gardens out of, just drill some holes in the bottom, let it drain out. These people have actually put a, a piece of pipe in here, if you can see that, it goes down into the soil and they fill the soil up pretty high so that you water through this pipe and then that saturates the soil in the, in the bowl. And that's a nice solution, you're not then knocking soil out of the pot that you have to clean up all the time. It stays really tidy and you can water this very easily and quickly. Um, but there's a lot of, this is a stone bowl. There's a lot of different kinds of bowl shaped um, planters that are really pretty. And these kinds of plants do really well in them. So like lettuce, radishes, chard, beets, arugula, bok choy, mustard, dill, and then cilantro. And I'm gonna put in a plug for creating yourself a little cilantro bowl, as well as a lettuce bowl. I think lettuce bowls are really easy to do. And, and if you are a first time gardener, this is a, almost a no brainer. You can buy some, you don't even have to buy the seed. You can buy packs of lettuce that are already grown for you and just plant them directly in there and you will get a great harvest. But I'm gonna put a plug in for cilantro bowl because cilantro is one of those magical plants that has um, leaves that people like to eat it has seeds that develop um, that you can eat and makes coriander seed. And it has these beautiful little white flowers on it that have a little umbrella shape. They're in the um, APACA family, which is the carrot family. This is a family of plant that actually has a lot of herbs in it and herbs and different veggies like fennel, um, parsley, uh, dill, cilantro, uh, lovage, angelica, a bunch of other things. Uh, these guys have um, a wonder power. The flower brings in a little parasitoid wasp that will lay eggs in your aphids if you have them and take care of them for you. And they love anything in this family. So having a bowl of cilantro around, letting it fully flower, um, which is really beautiful, um, you will attract these guys to your garden and they will help you manage insects in your in your yard and then it reseeds itself so once those seeds have developed you can collect some to use for cooking or you can let them fall into the soil. So for planting, um, planting tips for you 
are to first get everything together in the same place. So as you can see in this top picture, the soil's here, the plants in the pots are here. We put them in boxes so we're not like knocking them down, um, trying to keep them together. We've got our different pots here that we're planning on using and um, then we're gonna start working. Now you can use an empty pot to get into the bag of soil to fill up and, and pour into your container. You're gonna start by checking to make sure that any container you use has holes in it. Sometimes those decorative plastic pots that I showed you that look a little bit like terracotta pots and have decoration on them, those often come without holes punched out. They have the holes ready for you to punch out, but you have to take like a, a little um, dandelion digger or a, a screwdriver or something and um, a hammer and pop them out to make sure that the water will drain out. So check for holes. If you have a big clay pot that has a really large hole in the bottom, you can take broken pieces of clay uh, to place over that. There's still air and room for water to move out, but you're blocking a lot of soil from falling out of the bottom of the pot. And then you're gonna fill the pot with soil only to the level of where your deepest root ball would sit. And so whatever your plant is with, that's biggest is the plant that you want to start with. And that plant is gonna be your guide for where your soil goes in first. You're gonna put it in, um, in the bottom and you're gonna set it so that the top of the root ball is not gonna be buried any lower than it already is. So in other words, if you want the top of the root ball to be closer to the surface of the soil, you have to make sure that you put in enough soil to bring it up higher. You wanna leave a couple of inches of gap between the soil level and the top of the pot for ease of watering and to not spill soil out. So that's the measure that you're trying to get to. The top of the root ball should be right under the surface of where the soil is gonna to come to inside your pot. So that's your first measure. And then you start with that big plant. Is it going in the back? Is it going in the middle? Decide where you want that. Um, and then you're gonna place that in there. Now you want to, and one thing I forgot to mention in here, um, which I'll have to add, is that you need to pull the roots apart to some degree. So when you're looking at um, planting um, them, plants in the pot, you have to make sure that you're not just putting them in with the roots running around in circles. And I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, once you get it in there, you're gonna tamp soil in around it. You're gonna fill around the plant you're actually planting. And then you come in with the next tallest plants, uh, next biggest root balls, deepest root balls and you keep filling in as you go. You use your fingers sort of splayed out to sort of poke the soil in around everything. You don't wanna use your fist. You don't wanna put use your palm in your hand and compact it down. Just wanna settle it. You wanna get it so you're avoiding um, air pockets in the soil. And then you're gonna water it really well. And this is where it's important to make sure that you haven't brought the soil too high up to the sides of the pot. So here's how you prepare a root ball. You're gonna gently loosen the roots on potted plants. Now, often when you see them come out of the pot, you see they're sort of all like starting to wrap around each other. So in a plant like this, if it's soft enough, and then this is gonna be very easy to do with four inch plants that you're getting from the nursery, you would take your fingers and grab it on this side and this side and just pull them in opposite directions. And that's gonna create a rift down the middle here. And then you're gonna turn the plant and do it again. So you essentially end up with sort of a cross broken across the bottom of the plant. You can loosen some of these side roots up. You could take a knife and cut through them sharply. And anywhere you cut, they'll uh, start regenerating roots, but they won't regenerate to grow in a circle. They'll regenerate to grow out into the soil in the pot. And this is very important. Um, many years ago, we had a, a big heat wave in this area where oh, I was in July and there was like some day we got up to 104 degrees. There were a lot of plants that failed in landscapes that nobody was expecting, trees that had been living for years. Um, people went in and experimented and some folks up at Edmonds and Community College in particular went around and, and to bank parking lots and malls and places where things were dying 
and got permission to dig up the plant to see what was going on at the root level. And they discovered that a lot of these plants had never been properly prepared and put underground properly and the roots were just running in circles. So they had survived pretty well until they were stressed really badly. But the reality is even though they seem to be okay, that kind of condition makes them more vulnerable to issues over the long run. So it's really important to do. And you're gonna get roots growing really fast if you do that, just break this open. If you have a plant that's severely root bound like this bottom picture, you can see he's just cutting through with a knife. You don't wanna go this way. You don't wanna cut it off. You're not trying to cut off the bottom roots, you're trying to cut through the sides. Roots will regrow at these levels, but grow out into the soil. And you could put a series of cuts in this root ball and across the bottom as well. And that's all you really need to do. Um, they will grow very well. So you don't wanna completely disrupt the root ball. I've seen people take four inch pots and, and pull all the soil out of them and then put them in. Um, you're going to um, damage the roots a bit. You're gonna stress the roots, uh, maybe put the plant into shock. And you can also have the plant sink too far into the soil because you've really disturbed the root ball where you don't have anything of substance to put into the ground. Now you just have all these loose roots. Now there's a difference between that and bare root plants. When you buy bare root plants, they're intended to not have soil on them, but you will usually build some kind of dome in the bottom of the pot or the planting hole that you lay the roots over that, that gives them support. Um, so take care of the roots, make sure that they're doing what you need them to do, um, but, um, and also plant them at the same level as the top of the root ball. As I mentioned, you don't want to go any deeper than they already were, especially for woody plants. That puts soil and compost and mulch and whatever's on top up against the stem of the plant and can rot the plant out. But tomatoes are an exception. And this is why. They have these little primordia on the stems, these little bumps that you'll see um, if you look closely those are gonna develop into roots. If they never get underground, they're not likely to sprout, uh, but they are just waiting to grow. So you plant them more deeply as this person showing, he has a one gallon pot, he sunk it in the ground. You're gonna take that pot off, but he's measuring to make sure he's got it deep enough. So when the soil get, goes back over here, it's gonna come up to this level. All these leaves down here can be pinched off and everything along the stem then will grow roots <clears throat> as well as the root system that's already there. And that's gonna make a much healthier and sturdier plant and you're gonna get a better tomato um, plant off of that. In the picture on the right, <clears throat> you can see the deeper root um, planted pot. And then you also see one that if it's way too tall, you can turn it sideways and then have it come up. And that also creates this huge root mass under the soil. So tomatoes are pretty specialized. Um, again, you're, the implication here is that um, these are peat pots, but even if this was a peat pot, you would want to split that up so the roots can come out of there more easily or take it off altogether. Um, but if you have a pot on here, do not put that underground with your plant. Um, these are just illustrations to show um, the mechanics of it. Well, then you want to make sure you're watering properly. So there's all kinds of ways to water container gardens. If you have a very um, full, robust container garden, um, garden with multiple sizes and they're clustered together, you might want to consider doing drip irrigation because you could set up emitters in each of the pots, um, run them through all of them, and then have one outlet where it goes to the uh, faucet. It could e even be on a timer. Um, and then make it really easy to water. Um, you want to check for water needs um, daily after you've planted for a while to make sure that they are staying damp enough uh, because once they've been planted and transplanted, they're more vulnerable to drying out and to damage um, from drought. To do that and to be very effective to know how much you need to water, it's important to feel your soil. Put your hands into the soil get down in the soil a few inches, three, four, if you can. Um, damp and cool tells you that the plant is okay still. If, if, if it's starting to dry out in the top, um, you could give it a little bit of water. You could wait you know, a day or so and then water it thoroughly. Um, 
the more deeply you water any kind of plant, even in a container, the better the root system is going to grow. It's going to grow more deeply and then it will not dry out as fast because it's going to hold water at the deeper level than it will on top of the soil. Make sure that you go all the way around the plant in the pot um, so that you moisten the whole root ball and not just one side of it. Um, use these kinds of ergonomic water cans. These are great because you can grab them at different angles so that you can tilt it and turn it and get to the spots you need to get to. Um, they have nice soft water sprays that come out that don't disturb the plants. If you have a great container that has a lot of mixed plants in it, things like lobelia, petunias, you know, they get a little wilty when you water on top of them because they're very delicate and soft, but they'll pop back up more easily if you don't crush them with a really strong spray from a hose. So using things like this is very helpful. Um, and then you can use longer handled ones, and there's ones with even longer handles than this that have multiple spray um, nozzles on them um, for hanging planters. Um, the nice thing about these too is that I have one of these for my backyard. I have a bird bath that I use the jet spray on to clean out and then I turn it to the soaker um, or the um, shower. I usually use the shower setting um, to water my plants. Uh, but I can use it to spray off the patio if, you know, if I spilled some soil. Um, I can um, have misting uh, settings for new seedlings that are coming up. If I plant a lettuce bowl, I could use a misting setting. So these are really useful tools to have. Um, the other thing I'll point out too is that this preserves, uh, conserves water. You can turn them off when you're moving around so you're not just wasting water. Um, you can also turn it on only as high as you need it to be so you aren't over spraying something and water um, going out of the planter as well. So how do you know what plant likes what water? Well, um, part of it is experience. Part of it is reading up about what plants like, um, getting to know. Some of it is knowing where they come from. What is their you know, heritage? Something like the lavender that you see in this picture is a Mediterranean herb that grows on rocky, dry cliff sides by the sea where it gets a lot of wind wind can be dehydrating as well as sun. Uh, these guys don't need a ton of water. And so knowing the natural setting that they grow in can help you determine that. Something like a tomato also is more of sort of a desert plant, but um, in the wild, they grow kind of crazy in this big mass. You know, nobody's pruning them. They, they crawl along the ground and make a big mass. And they actually help to keep the soil cool underneath them by the way they grow. Um, we manage them and then we prune them and keep them up off the ground uh, to avoid diseases and to be able to get to the fruit. And so we want to be able to keep the soil moist enough um, to keep them happy. Uh, things like blossom end rot can happen on a tomato. It's not a disease, but it's a cultural issue where the soil has dried out too much and the tomato wasn't able to take up the calcium in the soil and then it gets this weird little kind of deformity on the end of the tomato itself. Um, it's not the end of the world. You can just cut that out when you pick the plant, but um, you do lose a bit of the tomato when you get blossom end rot. Um, remember that drought tolerance is not the same as drought proof. Most plants need some water at some point. A new plant um, going into a landscape needs at least two years of irrigation. So anything that's gonna be a permanent plant in your planters, you need to make sure that you're watering them well the first couple of years. After a few years, you may be able to slack off a bit more, but anything in a container will always need more water, um, more checking on for water uh, because they're more vulnerable because they're above ground. Uh, things like mint, like moist soil, they grow along stream sides, so don't let them dry out completely. They will die back. It's not the end of the world. They'll grow back. Um, but if you really want a good, robust mint plant, uh, do uh, keep it moist. Be sure to keep these in containers. They will go crazy in your garden and take over. So these are a perfect container plant to grow. Um, other things that are like the um, lavender, things like artichokes and rosemaries, sage, anything that's in the Mediterranean sort of climate. But most vegetables that we grow prefer some moisture in the soil. Very few of these like to dry out, so it's good to keep them sort of evenly moist, which is not damp, but where you feel cool, 
um, moist soil when you put your fingers in there. So when you're fertilizing, uh, my rule is usually for people to add a little bit of uh, fertilizer to the planting hole when they plant. And I recommend things like an all purpose fertilizer. Obviously this is intended for veggies, but you can also find ones that say vegetable mix on them. So whatever they're named, their formulation for what we call the NPK or the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium is just how many, um, um, what's the proportion of nitrogen to phosphorus to potassium. Nitrogen is for leaf growth. Potassium helps to develop fruits and flowers. So in this case, if you wanna grow good tomatoes, you need to have a decent amount of potassium. And then phosphorus helps integrity of the plant, cell wall strength um, and um, reproductive um, functions. So it's, it's important to have all three, but there's also a ton of micronutrients, which you're gonna find in something like the seaweed extract. And one of the things I like about seaweed extract and kind of these liquid kelp fertilizers, is they're really great for transplant shock. So after you've put a little bit of fertilizer in the soil and you've planted your plant, you're gonna go water it in, get a bucket, you know, watering can, put some seaweed extract in there, you know, follow the label directions on all of these. They, they will tell you exactly how much to use and then water it in. And that's gonna help the plant to get over some of the shock of having its root system disturbed. Um, you can also top dress with a little thin layer of compost, which will help to protect the soil, keep it a little bit cooler in the summertime. And it adds a little nutrient to the microorganisms in the soil will start to pull that down. Um, now, when you're buying these products, these soil products, sometimes they're more sterile than you know your own garden bed would be. Uh, but things find their way in there and there are um, sometimes things already in the plants that you buy because they've been sitting in pots for a while and a little ecosystem is built up and so this this kind of material also helps to feed them because really it's the microorganisms in the soil that feed your plant so you it's important to um, use natural organic and slow release things. For general maintenance, I use liquid fertilizers for um, container gardens because I don't want to keep disturbing the soil and the soil level or the soil surface um, because you need to scratch fertilizers in these kind of uh, granular types. So there's a bunch of different things. Um, this one here has actually um, a, a kelp and seaweed mixture. And then um, Alaska more bloom is for when you're using it just to promote bloom. Uh, the bloom growth on something and then fresh fertilizer for nitrogen. Some people alternate back and forth between these, especially if you're doing things like fuchsia baskets uh, because that will keep them blooming and healthy uh, the entire summer. So these are some of the heavy feeders. Uh, remember these are also, if you look at the bigger plants usually and or um, big fruit producers, big leafy greens use a lot of nitrogen. There's a ton of nitrogen in those leaves. They need, a, they need more food than other things. And then things like these plants and those Mediter Mediterranean plants and this cute little thyme plant, um, you don't need a lot of fertilizers. In fact, they don't need to be fertilized usually. Um, most vegetables otherwise benefit from added fertilizer. And that would be just your general you know, veggie garden mix. So here's some great choices for containers and some ideas and ways people have done things. This little guy is a hanging plant just along the railing with a big pepper plant in it. They do really well. Um, these are some of my favorite things to grow and that I would recommend if you're a first time grower that you try because you will have success with them. So strawberries, peppers, chives, basil, blueberry, thyme, cilantro, and huckleberry. And most of these don't have a lot of pest issues Strawberry's biggest problem is these luscious berries. If slugs get to them, they like to eat them and sometimes the squirrels will steal them. I actually had a um, possum on my back porch last year because I have a little bowl of strawberries and uh, she was eating my strawberries. Um, these are some of the things to watch for. Um, uh, some of the pests that you might have. Apples can have codling moth and, uh, moth and apple bagot. It's important to protect the fruit so you can bag them um, with nylons like these are footies. Um, there's a lot of resources online about this. Uh, City Fruit has tons of information about these issues to look at. 
uh, even in a container, you need to worry about that. Imported cabbage worm butterfly, these are flying right now. They're those little white butterflies in the garden. You can put floating row cover, which is a polyester fabric that lets light air and water through. And um, you have to keep it on all summer long, but it keeps these guys from laying their eggs on your um, produce. Slugs, uh, beer traps, yeast traps um, in the areas where the slugs are work really well. You could put them nearby the pots, you know, just sort of in and around, hidden around them, and the slugs will um, be drawn to them because they prefer the yeasty foods over the plants themselves. And then sometimes you can get problems with birds eating your fruits on your trees and shrubs. Uh, you want to make sure if you're going to net them to use fine mesh so they don't get um, tangled as easily or tolerate some sharing. Um, but you can also net the fruit and not the whole plant um, to make it a little safer for them. Bring in pollinators, attract other be beneficial insects. Uh, this is sort of the whole life cycle of a lady beetle, a ladybird or a ladybug, depending on what you call it. Here's the adult here, and here's the adult going after aphids. And here's an ant who's probably farming these aphids. They farm them and move them around because they collect the honeydew or the sugar sap, sap that they, is their waste product that comes out of the plant. And so these guys are farming them while the ladybug's eating them. I'm sure the ladybug doesn't mind, it's more food for her. This is the larval form. They look like little tiny alligators. They eat as many aphids as the adult does, I think maybe even more. They run around on the leaf and, and they move very fast. And sometimes people get alarmed by them. This is good news if you see these in your garden. And these are the eggs that you can see kind of sticking out at the bottom here. You want to be aware of the different life cycles of these guys because you don't want to disturb them. You want to protect them. You don't want to spray them. You don't want to panic and remove them. This is what um, the most vulnerable stage of a ladybug is. This is the pupil stage. So it's gone from this stage to this stage. It attaches itself to the leaf. And um, at that point, it can't move, it can't do anything to protect itself, so you want to protect it as much as you can. And then it will um, develop into these beautiful adults. And then they fly around and do their job. Lady beetles, parasitoid wasps, soldier beetles, all really, really great insects to have in the garden. You, If you include a lot of flowers, you will be sure to attract them. There's only 1% to 3% of the insects that you see in your garden are plant-eating pests. So we want to avoid spraying things, even oils and soaps, which can kill these beneficials. Um, it's better to think in terms of how do you manage your garden as habitat? How do you bring these guys in to help you? Um, beneficial insects nest in your garden, often on your plants. And so providing habitat for them is, is very important. Um, for pollinators, you can provide other kinds of habitat, like places for in, uh, solitary bees to lay their eggs, um, bumblebees to nest, they nest in the ground. Here's some resources for you. Um, these are all really good books. The Bountiful Container is a really um, wonderful book that covers everything I've said plus a lot more. Maritime Northwest Garden Guide that we have at Tilth goes through month by month planning for an organic garden um, with specialized articles about things like crop rotation and beneficial insects. And then this is a fun book about how to attract beneficial insects to the garden. So the three of these together are really a really good start for um, learning how to do container gardening and doing it in a natural way um, so that you have a beautiful garden. You don't have to waste resources or pollute local waterways and um, bring in lots of diverse creatures to your garden. And then other resources that we have, uh, the Garden Hotline, um, has a telephone and email service for you guys to use. Um, we also do a Q&A on Facebook once a month, usually the third Wednesday, but not always. It depends on what other activities we're doing. Um, but you can call us or email us or go to our website. There's articles there. And there's also a forum to ask questions. And then the Master Gardeners are um, an incredible resource and they are doing some online clinics as well as um, their plant sale coming up. Um, and then Tilt, we have classes uh, about many of these things, including container gardening, um, that are some of our classes are becoming hybrid where we're doing some hands-on and then some online learning. Um, but then our May edible plant sale is also coming up very soon. 
Uh, that's the first week of May. In fact, we start receiving plants next week. So it's a great time to be learning about all of this. Uh, this was last year at the Rainier Beach Urban Farm, uh, the plant sale, tilt plant sale, and our little duck friends that joined us that day to sit in the viola patch. Um, violas, uh, by the way, are a fabulous plant for containers. So that's what I got today. Awesome, thanks so much, Laura. And we have some great questions here, a bunch of them. So I will we'll try to go through as many as we can before we run out of time. Apologize, uh, apologies if I don't see your question or, or get to it, um, but let's dive in. So the, the biggest question with the most uh, thumbs up is about watering. So during the summer when it's hot, how do you keep the pot watered, especially if you're leaving town for a week? Um, you know, just because a pot, assuming it's going to dry out quicker than a normal garden bed would do. And then maybe if you could also speak to uh, options about that for, for folks in apartments that may not have an outdoor water stick at hand. Mm. Yeah, good idea. Um, so you have to think about your lifestyle when you're choosing what you're going to plant and where, what kind of pot you're going to put it in. I am home a lot. I garden a lot. So I can put these tiny little pots on my railing but even I miss a day and then they get dried out. So that's not something you wanna be doing if you are a traveler, a hiker, you know, somebody who likes to get out away from home and isn't a, going to be wanting to spend a lot of time, you know, nurturing and catering to these guys. So think bigger, make bigger pots, get pots that don't dry out as fast like those um, glazed terracotta, those are great. Or some of the plastic, big, bigger plastic pots. Um, cluster your plants so you have a lot of different plants in there and they're shading each other and helping protect the root, you know, the soil isn't getting as much sun on it so it doesn't dry out quite as, quite as fast. So those are ways to sort of mitigate that. Um, if you're going to go away for a week and you have a bunch of containers, you really should have somebody come and water them and check them. Um, it's really hard. People try those those products that have like the water bulbs on them and then the water slowly disperses. For smaller part, pots, you may be able to get away with some of that, but you know, that's a lot of water bulbs to buy to put in all your pots. Um, it's really worth it to get a friend or hire a neighborhood kid or, you know, have somebody just come water them for you. If you do have the capacity to have a drip system, you just have it on a timer. You won't need to worry about it so much because it will do its own thing. Um, for those of you in patios, um, then if you are going to leave, and that's a little more difficult, uh, I would veer towards setting up your situation so you have pots that don't dry out quite as dramatically as others would. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, how about a couple for pest deterrents? So we, we, I know you spoke to this a little bit, but maybe just reiterate. Um, are there natural deterrent options for squirrels? <laughs> and then also, again, the options for slugs and snails. So I'm going to start with slugs and snails because they're easier. Mammals are always harder to deal with. People worry more about things like slugs and then insects, um, you know, because that's sort of the classical thing that's attacking our plants. But mammals, you know, they have, they're wily and um, they learn um, and they change behavior based on whatever you do. So slugs and snails, Beer trapping uh, or using the yeast um, in the water as a trap is super, super um, effective. So placing those near where your plants are being eaten only for the period that they're being eaten. Um, sometimes, for instance, if a dahlia is in a pot and it's trying to grow and the slugs keep mowing it down, put a little slug uh, trap inside the pot, um, bury it in the soil a little ways. You don't have to put it all level to the soil. They will climb up and over. And um, you will find the slugs will be more attracted to that. Leave your dahlia alone, it'll grow. You can take the trap away. It doesn't matter if they eat the bottom leaves. So you can deal with those. There are also iron phosphate products that are okay to use. They're not, they're fairly safe, but um, whenever you use a product, you have manufacturing footprints, um, but you also have potential for harming wildlife. Birds eat that. We don't know what really happens to them if they eat it. Pets shouldn't eat a lot of iron. So um, just be aware of that. Um, squirrels. So squirrels, if there are some things that help. If you're putting in potted plants and they're trying to dig in your pots, 
sometimes they're digging to plant things. So I have walnut trees that grow in my backyard because the squirrels. Um, so that walnut tree I'm trying to give away actually was planted by a squirrel. Um, you can put soil in to the level where you're gonna put your root ball in and um, start planting your plants and then get some hardware cloth from the um, hardware store. That's that really stiff um, uh, like fence type fabric, that, uh, wire fabric that has little squares. You wanna cut that in pieces and place that around your plants as you're filling the soil. You want that up at the top, not too deep under the soil, maybe a couple inches. So they can't dig. They'll hit that and they'll get discouraged and go away. It's really effective for bulbs because you can put your bulbs underneath it and let the bulb tips grow through it. You just need the holes to be big enough for the uh, tips to grow through. Um, so that works really well. Pepper, uh, cayenne works really well uh, on squirrels. Uh, they won't eat a bird suet um, that has cayenne in it, for instance, but you can use it in your plants. So if you have a really bad problem, you can try that for a while. Sometimes they'll give up because they get dissuaded too many times, but it does wash out with the rain and you have to reapply it. And literally I just take cayenne from my kitchen and sprinkle it in the top of the soil. All right, thanks. How about uh, a couple questions about reusing soil or potting soil specifically? What are the limits around that? What, what should we be aware of there? So reusing potting soil in things that have uh, types of plants that may have disease issues, which we didn't really go into. So tomatoes are susceptible to late blight. It's a soil-borne disease, it splashes up onto the plant. You want to refresh your tomato pot soil periodically. So if you need to do something else with that soil, you can use it for something else and add compost to it and add some of those other nutrients like I showed you in the make your own potting soil slide. And then you can sort of refresh and recreate your soil. So it lasts for a long time. I mean, I don't do that. I probably every four years, I, I do major changes. And after two years, I'm probably monkeying with it a little bit. Um, but yes, it's important to refresh it periodically. You can bring fresh soil in and do kind of half and half and make it go farther. I do that a lot. Um, and then if you have a garden space also, you can use it in your garden beds, you know, once you get past the point of wanting to keep refreshing it. Awesome, thanks. Um, the next question is about perennials. Um, so, you know, perennial, something that is eventually gonna be bigger. Uh, is it best to just start it in that big size pot or is it okay to kind of, you know, progressively transplant it into bigger and bigger pots? Um, depends on the plant really. A tomato is an annual so it's, that's something you know that you're going to grow immediately obviously in a big pot but yes those perennial plants usually do better if they are sort of grown up in different pot sizes. Um, if you have too much soil say you got a pot that was big enough to hold a mature rosemary but you bought it as a four inch pot it's going to drown in that pot. It's going to the soil is going to stay too wet because there's nothing using the water in the, in the soil. And so you could rot out that rosemary because it doesn't like to stay wet. So it's better to start it in like four inch pot, put it into a eight inch pot when you get it. And then you can go up from there until you get to your final size. Um, so those growing sizes too could be, um, they could be things that um, are decorative or things that are just utilitarian. And then the other thing you could do is put it in to start with in the big pot, but plant a bunch of annuals with it that can grow to fill the space and use the water in the soil. So while that plant is little, you have company and when it gets bigger, it has its own pot. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question, and you, you touched on this briefly, but maybe if you had to pick kind of a top two fruit, top two veggie um, that in terms of easiest for beginners to grow. Lettuce, first of all, lettuce okay. bowl, super easy. Um, I'm gonna veer out of uh, fruit and veggie to cilantro and still give a plug for that because it's a beautiful flower, super useful, grows really easy, grows really fast and you can reseed it and keep doing it all summer long. Um, fruit, blueberry, um, super easy in a pot. I have three of them in my patio. I have room in the ground to put them, but I'd like them in my pot because they're right sort of nestled around where we sit and eat out there. Um, 
And then I would say things like um, chard. You like chard, leafy, leafy stuff like that. Do really well in a pot. And then those columnar apples, super easy in a pot. Awesome, thank you. And how about, okay, so you, yeah, we talked about this a little bit, um, but the metal water tanks, is there any concern about uh, like the zinc leaching out, getting food? There's not. People have looked at that. There hasn't been much um, concern. They're used as water stock tanks, you know, and so um, the galvanizing helps to keep that intact pretty much. What you do want to think about is where they're sourced from. Uh, buy USA made ones uh, because they do not use lead in the um, soldering process for those, uh, but they do if they come from overseas or somewhere else, you don't know uh, if they do or don't. Um, and usually they do. Um, so that's something to be concerned about, but nobody's seen any effects. If there was enough zinc leaching, the plant wouldn't grow very well either. Um, so it, that's something to be aware of. Awesome, thanks. And a question about blueberries with leaves uh, that have some brownish sort of blight looking leaves. Is that something you run into or? Uh, that can happen. There are some um, fungal diseases uh, that happen to blueberries that are, um, that can be a problem. Uh, that's what the hotline is for. Definitely, if you're interested in knowing more, if you have photos of them, send them to us. We'll look at them for sure and, and help you figure that out. Um, sometimes it's just drought damage uh, that's happened over the years. And, you know, sometimes it's incidental fungal issues that aren't going to go anywhere and you don't need to worry about it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I'll send out the, in a, I'll, you all will get a follow-up email tomorrow from me and we'll all include the, the number and the website and email for, for Laura and the folks at the Garden Hotline there. So definitely encourage you to use that resource. Uh, we'll, we'll take a couple more of these. We still have 10 minutes here. So um, is it true that coffee grounds can be used as a fertilizer? It is true. Coffee grounds are pretty cool. They are, when you're talking about composting, if you came to the composting talk, you might have heard this, um, but comp, uh, coffee grounds are considered a green when we're talking about mixing greens and browns and compost, even though they're very brown because they're high in nitrogen. So anything we consider a green is high in nitrogen. Anything we consider brown is high in carbon. So high in nitrogen, um, people worry about them. They think they're acidic, but when you've used them, you have pulled all that acidity into the coffee and put it into your stomach instead. And so now that's gone. Um, they're pretty almost neutral. They, the pH on coffee grounds can be as high as 6.8, which seven is neutral. So they're fine to use. Um, you want to be aware that because of the nitrogen content, they can cause things to grow. You know, you're adding fertilizer when you do that. So don't do it too late in the season because you're gonna encourage things to grow when you may not, you want them to be sort of winding down. Um, so it's great for summer, great for soil. It's, I actually like it better to sort of mix into soil mixes. Um, sometimes I'll top dress certain things with them uh, and it does fine. I put them around my tomatoes last year. Um, I have a sack actually sitting in my driveway. I'm trying to decide what to do with now. But yes, they are. Nice. So maybe if you could just weigh in on this uh, debate, uh, the, the new fad, the new craze of growing tomatoes on a hanging string versus maybe a more traditional method, you know, a big <laughs> pot with those nice wire cages. Where do you land on that? Uh, the wire string is fabulous. We've done that a lot at Tilt. Um, grown them sort of in lot rows with um, a support above them with the string hanging down. You can buy actually these wire stakes that are curly cue. Um, and I use those in my pot sometimes for certain tomatoes. Now it depends on what tomato variety you're growing um, because some of them that are huge and big, the indeterminates that grow crazy, uh, that would not be enough to hold them. But for for a determinate tomato, for instance, it's a good support system. What happens is a tomato ha does happen to like to grow a bit like a vine. And so it wraps itself around there and you, you just keep wrapping it around the, 
the string and that little bit of support actually helps to hold it up and when you get it full of tomatoes that might be a different story and that can help you can help support that by having additional bamboo stakes or wire um, and or just more strings that you attach to the plant but no they work just fine it's a part of this is aesthetics part of it is your setup what kind of room do you have can you make a line like that or not why a basic wire tomato cage is not going to hold a big indeterminate tomato so if you got yourself a big huge pot and wanted to grow like a you know like a sun gold tomato which everybody knows grows like crazy you would need to prune it and you would need to have more than a cage around there because uh, it's not going to hold it in place awesome thanks uh, how about uh, when when the best time is to trim lavender and rosemary uh, so lavender can be pruned a few different times during the year. Um, you know, what I do with mine is usually do a little trimming, like right about now, I trim for um, getting dead wood out and straggly pieces just to make it, excuse me, and make it look good. Then it blooms. And then generally I let those blooms stay for a long time. I trim some of them to use in the house and to dry but I leave a lot because they're powerful pollinator attractors. Um, a lavender plant in full bloom, a big, you know, healthy one can have like dozens of species on there at any given time of flying insects. Uh, it's pretty wondrous. And so leave them to bloom. And then when they're completely done, then you can trim the flowers out and you can prune the plant also at that time. So those are good sort of rules of thumb that I use that work really well for me. Um, rosemary is a little bit different. Um, mine needs pruning now. I'm looking out my window because I have two of my parking strip that are huge. One of them was better. I pruned better last year. I didn't get as far on the other one. And so it's a little more straggly, but they're full of flowers right now still. They've been blooming since January. They're still now in full bloom and the hummingbirds love them. So I'm not bothering them until they're done blooming and then I'm going to trim them. And I have trimmed them in the, in the spring after they've done blooming. I've trimmed them in the summer and I've trimmed them again in the winter when I wanna use the greens for like wreath making and things like that. So rosemary can be pruned most times of the year, just avoid the bloom time. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions about rabbit control and I guess I'm also curious how much does, you know, wood containers help with that? And then a, a related question about rats getting into uh, tomato containers. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, mammals are the hardest things to manage. So rabbits have exploded in the Northwest. Um, it used to be the city of Seattle didn't have very many. I live in West Seattle and, you know, I see them up the street. I haven't had them come in my yard yet, knock on wood. Um, but they have, they're in every neighborhood here now and people are having issues with them. Containers can help because they really like things that are more at their level that they want to root around in. Um, they are very, you know, the, the Beatrix Potter stories got it right in the cabbage patch. They love things in that plant family. So be aware of that, especially to protect those. Um, sometimes you can have a container that you have you could use, you know, it's not much fun if you want to look at something decorative. If you're trying to do more functional growing, big black pot, you've got your big broccoli plant in there. You could put, you could put a, a tomato cage around that and wrap it with that floating row cover. Um, and then the, the rabbit can't get to it. And it's, the plant's going to grow just fine underneath there. So it's a way to protect it. A broccoli plant doesn't need pollination. So you don't need to worry about removing it. For fruiting plants, you would need to come up with some other kind of mechanism. Um, I have protected things from rabbits. We used to care, take care of the garden at the Pickering Barn in Issaquah with tilth, and we um, had things under cloches, and then we transitioned the plastic to floating row cover, and the rabbits didn't want to go inside of that structure. So building any kind of thing like that around your plants um, can deter them and raising them up does deter them a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's hard. Rats um, are really smart. They prefer healthy, nutritious food over garbage. So they will always pick the best food to eat in the garden. Um, they're bold, they come out in the daytime. The pea patches in this area have trouble with them climbing the corn in the summer and eating the corn before anybody can get to it. 
um, they have to trap them. So trapping is what they do for rats primarily. They're difficult. They can squeeze into tiny holes. They are, you know, their mus their bones are very flexible. And uh, how about okay to tuck edible flowers in with the veggies in a pot? Absolutely, and it's a fabulous practice because not only are you having flowers to eat, but you're also bringing in your pollinators and your beneficials very close to uh, where they need to be. Um, so my recommendation always when people are growing a vegetable garden in the ground and a raised bed in a pot is to include flowers. If you can't get it in the same pot, have pots of flowers right around them. So don't have your herb garden, your flower garden, your veggie garden separated. These need to be combined. That's gonna be healthier. Gotcha. Okay, and then a question about tomatoes and you, you covered this a bit, um, but just about how deep in the soil are they typically planted if you're- Well, starting? if I have a tomato that's yay tall, and this is to the bottom of the pot. So the root system may be this deep and the tops are this high. And I go to plant it in the soil. I'm gonna plant it at least to this level, but I'm actually gonna take it probably halfway up. So it's gonna look silly. You have this beautiful base, especially if you've got a one gallon tomato pot. You have this beautiful plant, like, oh, it's so big, it's beautiful. And then you plant it and it looks tiny again because you buried half the stem. It'll grow. It'll grow in no time, it'll be twice as big again. So don't be afraid to do it. Take the leaves off and just bury it at least halfway, whatever awesome. size it is. And then related question on the tomato front, um, uh, how do you identify the sucker leaves? And maybe you can just mention oh. why that's important. Yeah, um, look online for pictures because there's a tremendous amount of, of information that people have done YouTube recordings, there's lots of photos. So the plants that are gonna sucker are the indeterminate ones. The determinate uh, tomatoes don't really sucker very much. There's some that are sort of in between the two that, that will, um, but you'll know when you buy the variety what it is. If it says a little D on the label, that's a determinate tomato. Um, otherwise they usually don't mention it and they assume that most of them are indeterminate. So when you're looking at a tomato stem, there's the main stalk when you buy the plant and there's leaves coming out any leaf junction is a potential place for a sucker to come out. So just keep your eye on where the leaves join the stem on your original plant as it grows. Sometimes you miss them and all of a sudden one grows and now you have two tops. Um, you can just trim that out again. I, I often let multiple tops grow and then pick and choose how many I want and leave it at that. Um, some people like using that string method. You have one liter only and you just you know let that keep growing. Um, so you can do them in different ways. And there are people who do what they call, call dry, dry, um, so dry farming, uh, where they let the tomato completely branch out and don't do any pruning. And that's what I was talking about with it keeps the moisture in the soil underneath it, keeps it cooler. You do run more risk of diseases that way, but you can do it, especially if you're not watering a lot, or if you do the pipe watering, you know, put tubes in around the root ball. Um, but look, the, that's the case where the suckers have been left to grow completely. You will know if you are watching it from start to finish, you will start to see and recognize where those suckers are and do go look online because there's lots and lots of good pictures of them. Awesome. Thanks so much. And apologies here. We are, we are over our time limit and we still have a ton of questions we didn't get to. Um, so I just want to thank Laura for your time. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen back really quick, uh, hopefully, there we go, um, and just mention um, that this was the last class in our series, um, and we have, we've been doing these photo activities each week that go along with the class, so we have some awesome raffle prizes there, um, some beeswax food wraps, uh, have some coffee thermoses, a couple other items, um, so we want to see how this goes for you, so um, send, send me a photo by Monday of your veggie garden, such as it may be, or your veggie container for a chance to enter this raffle. Um, and you'll get an email from me so you can just reply to that, or you can go to shorelinewa.gov slash earthday. And there you'll also see all of the submitted photos for all of the challenges we've been doing this month. It's been really cool to see 
um, all the great things people are doing to, to live sustainably and, and protect our planet. So uh, thank you again for joining us and thanks everybody for, um, yeah, for the great questions and participation and look out for an email from me tomorrow. So have a great evening and goodbye. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye.